All right. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm Darren from the Commenter team, and this is the second session of our Developer Growth Summit 2022. Um, this talk is called Our Journey to Accessibility at Adobe Workfront. And if this is the first session at, uh, if, you're, if this is your first session at the summit, I want to give some quick instructions before introducing a speaker and topic. Um, we're using the Zoom webinar. Uh, it is completely normal that you can't see other attendees, um, but as you can see in the chat, there are a lot of you here. So feel free to interact and just set the, set the chat to send to everybody if you want to talk to everyone else. Um, yeah, uh, you also notice a Q&A feature on the toolbar on the bottom. And this is where you can ask questions during the talk and you can also upvote on other people's questions. And the speaker will get to your questions either during the talk or at the end. I think, I think we'll, we'll, we'll do most of the questions at the end. And last but not least, please follow our code of conduct so we can all have a good experience. The link to it is in the chat. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Okay, so now I want to officially introduce our speaker, um, Tyler Hawkins. And Tyler is a senior software engineer at Adobe. Um, yeah, now you, can, you should be able to see him. Um, he is uh, passionate about sharing knowledge and he's written many articles which have been read a million times collectively, which I think is really impressive. And he's going to be sharing about his experience with accessibility at Adobe Workfront. So I'm really looking forward to it. Um, Tyler, now it's your turn. Awesome. Thank you, Darren. Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, I'm excited to, to speak with you all. Um, just give me just a second, let me share my screen and we will get going. Okay, Darren, is that looking okay? Yeah, looks good to me. Perfect. All right, um, well, the title for the talk today is uh, Our Journey to Accessibility at Adobe Workfront. Um, as Darren said, my name is Tyler. Um, I'm a senior software engineer and tech lead at Adobe. Uh, if you wanna follow me on social media anywhere, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, not so much on Twitter. Um, and I do write a lot, so Medium is a great place. Uh, if you wanna see the things I'm thinking about and writing about. Um, and so, yeah, today we're going to be talking about uh, accessibility. Um, for the last year or so, um, I've been leading our accessibility efforts um, from the engineering side at Adobe Workfront as we strive to make our app more accessible um, for users of, of all abilities or disabilities. Um, if, you're, if you're not uh, familiar with accessibility or, or uh, quite, quite know what it is, um, accessibility is essentially the act of of making your app usable for everyone, um, which often means making sure that people can use it um, with a mouse or with a keyboard or with assistive technology, um, like a screen reader. Um, it involves making sure that things are uh, visible to people that maybe have uh, color blindness or, or just low vision. Um, so it's essentially trying to make uh, your app more inclusive and, and more usable for everyone. Um, and so as we, as we talk today, um, I think the main takeaway and the thing that I, that I want you to get out of this um, is to know that accessibility is more of an organizational challenge than it is a technical one. Um, and that doesn't mean that, that accessibility is necessarily easy. Um, there are things that can be, can be technically challenging. Um, some things are, are fairly technically simple. Um, other things are more difficult to implement. Uh, but more what I've found is, is it's more of an organizational challenge. It's hard to um, get things moving in a company and to, to help people to focus on accessibility. Um, and so just thinking through some of these organizational challenges, um, some you might consider are uh, questions like, why should you make your app accessible? Uh, why do you personally care? Why should others care and prioritize this? Um, how do you get buy-in from upper management? You know, maybe you are an accessibility advocate, but uh, the company isn't as excited about those efforts as you are. Um, how do you convince upper management to allocate time and resources uh, to this kind of work? Um, assuming that you've, you've got the green light and the go-ahead to, to start on this kind of stuff, um, where do you start? Where do you start when remediating, when remediating your app, um, especially if it's a large app or you're a large company and have um, a lot of code out there that, that needs some love. Um, questions like who's going to do the actual work? You know, it's one thing to say you're going to do it, but it's another thing to actually put together a team or to, uh, to prioritize it and decide who's going to work on this thing. Um, how do you get buy-in from the rest of the engineering organization? Maybe you believe it's important and upper management believes it's important, but what about the rest of, of the engineers? 
Um, and then finally, how do you make accessibility a sustainable practice? You know, it's not enough to just focus on accessibility for a couple of months and then forget about it. You have to make this um, something that's baked into your development life cycle uh, forever. So those are some of the questions um, that we'll talk about today, some of those organizational challenges. Um, so to give you just a little bit of backstory, um, I've been at uh, Workfront for about two years. I joined in March 2020. Um, in December of 2020, Workfront was acquired by Adobe, and then we officially became Adobe employees uh, in February 2021. Um, so it's been a little over a year now. So when I talk about Workfront or Adobe Workfront, um, what I mean is, is the Workfront product, the Workfront app, um, and the Workfront engineering organization uh, within the larger Adobe company and Adobe engineering organization. Um, so to give you a little bit more of a backstory, um, when I first joined the company, um, joined Workfront, uh, one of the things that I was hired to do was to help make our product more accessible. Um, Workfront has been around as a company for a little over 20 years now. Uh, the app is absolutely massive. There's a lot of code that's been written over the last 20 years. Um, and we, we needed to do some work to make it more accessible. Um, it was not necessarily a, a top priority in the past. Um, and so when, when evaluating uh, the accessibility of your product um, or of your website, the, the internationally recognized standard is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG for short. Uh, the current version is 2.1. They're currently working on a, a 3.0 uh, major revision of it. There are three different levels of conformance. You can have A, AA, or AAA. Uh, within the guidelines, there are four general principles and then 13 guidelines. And within those guidelines, there's several like very specific success criteria um, for whether or not you are um, meeting that guideline or, or following that standard. And there's 78 of those in total. So they're broken up into um, A, AA, and AAA, um, again, which are varying levels where A is the easiest to achieve. Uh, AA is, is kind of the industry standard of what you shoot for. And AAA is, uh, is much more strict and, and a bit harder to achieve. Um, and so when I joined Workfront in early 2020, uh, we, we failed to meet uh, most of the WCAG 2.1A and AA standards. Uh, we, had, we had a lot of work to do. And that didn't necessarily mean that we, we failed in every single success criteria. Um, we did pass in some of them. When, when uh, reporting on this or trying to measure it, often what you'll do is you'll fill out uh, what's called a VPAT or Voluntary Product Accessibility Template. And with that, you create your accessibility conformance report, the ACR. And it essentially just goes through each of the success criteria and you try to find examples in your app so that you can definitively say, yes, we support this or we partially support it. We do it okay in some places and not so well in other places or we just do not support this at all. Um, and so in July of 2020, we, we created our accessibility conformance report. Um, and of those, there are 50 A and AA success criteria. Uh, you can see we, we supported 23 of them, partially supported 19 and did not support eight. Um, and that sounds okay until you, you add them up to say only 23 out of, out of 50, that's, that's less than half. Uh, partially supports is also not as, encourage, as encouraging as you may think. You, know, you could say that something is partially supported uh, if you, you know, even support it in just a couple places in your app where there's maybe hundreds of instances where you don't. So it's kind of subjective. Um, so if you want to look at this as just a pass fail, you could say we, we passed in 23 of them and, and failed in 27. So we had a lot of work to do. Um, and so that was really our, our starting point of, you know, okay, this, this is where we're at. Uh, it's, it's not looking too good right now. Again, this is back in, in early 2020. Um, and so where do we, where do we start? Um, and so the first, like going back to those organizational questions, um, I think the first question is, was asking ourselves personally, right, of why should we make our app accessible? Um, and really, I think it comes down to three reasons or three categories of reasons. Um, there are financial reasons, legal reasons, and moral reasons. Um, so speaking financially, um, an accessible product is a sellable product. Um, especially if you are a tech company or a SaaS company, uh, often when, uh, when, when different businesses are evaluating your product and considering to buy, accessibility is one of those um, criteria that they look for. Um, and so by not having an accessible product, you are losing out on potential deals and customers and buyers. Um, from a legal standpoint, 
uh, you might be contractually obligated to have an accessible app. Um, I know in, in several cases um, with, with our own company, um, some of our clients have, have some very specific language in their details of, of certain standards that we need to follow in order to uphold their contract. Um, if you're something like a, uh, a government or any sort of company that uh, has a, a public facing uh, good or service that you sell that's available to the public, uh, in the US at least, you are legally obligated to provide an accessible website um, that's under the American with Disabilities Act. Um, you're legally required to, um, to allow people of, of all abilities or disabilities to, to interact with, with your site and with your product to, to use your service or good. Uh, and then finally, there's moral reasons. Um, this, I think, should be the strongest motivator, um, but it's, it's the right thing to do. Uh, you know, you're, you might have specific target audiences for your app or your product, um, but that sh really shouldn't be dictated by ability or disability. Um, especially when you think about uh, our product of Workfront, if, if that's the future of work management and remote work, um, who is that for? Is that for just, you know, able-bodied people only? No, it's, it's for everyone. Um, and so I think, uh, I think that's, that's the, the largest reason is the moral reason. It's, it's the right thing to do. Um, so once you have that personal uh, motivation, right, of, of why should we make our app accessible, uh, the next question would be, okay, so how do you get buy-in from upper management? Um, and the key is, is really to speak their language. You know, it's, it's great if you are motivated out of a, a desire to do the right thing. Um, but it, it may be cynical to say that businesses are, are a little more cold-hearted than that, right? We have to consider um, the cost benefits, the financial um, costs and benefits of, of making our app accessible. Um, and so if you're talking to someone that's, a, you know, a, a chief financial officer or, or a VP of, of sales or product or marketing, um, speak their language, put it in business terms. You know, we, we are losing deals by not having an accessible product. Uh, you might need to remind them we're, we're contractually obligated for, you know, customers X, Y, and Z uh, to meet certain accessibility standards. Uh, when you can start to put this into the business language and the language of, of maybe things that they think about on a day-to-day -day basis, um, it's a lot easier to get to get buy-in. Um, so let's assume you've got buy-in, right? You've, you've got the go-ahead to, uh, to help make your, your app more accessible and to focus on these things. Uh, so where do you actually start when making your app more accessible? Um, there's really two main challenges. So the first is remediating existing content. So assuming that you have a, an existing app and maybe your company has been around for several years or decades, maybe. Um, you've got a lot of content out there. You've got a lot of work that you'll probably have to go back and fix. Um, and then secondly, you'll need to make sure that new content is built with accessibility in mind. You know, it's, it's not enough just to remediate the old stuff. You don't wanna keep digging yourself in a hole and continue to build uh, parts of your product that are not accessible to begin with. So figuring out how to bake that into uh, your, your engineering processes. And so let's talk about uh, remediating, remediating the existing content. Um, so where do you start when remediating your app? Uh, there's, there's probably three possible approaches that you could take. Um, you could try to focus on different violation types. So maybe you want to say, you know, we have a lot of color contrast issues in our app. So let's go through all of our pages and make sure that um, all of them have appropriate color contrast ratios where there's a good difference between the foreground and background, or we have a lot of icon only buttons and let's make sure that all of these have appropriate ARIA labels so that screen readers can, can interact with them and understand what the buttons are. So you might focus on the violation types um, or you might focus on pages. Um, you know, maybe you have X amount of pages in your app and, and you wanna focus on a few of those. Um, that's a, a valid approach as well. Um, or maybe you want to focus on workflows. Um, workflows is honestly probably the, the best approach there because users, you know, users don't use your app just to visit a page. They use it to accomplish some task, right? And so uh, with a product like Workfront uh, being a project management, work management tool, um, someone might want to uh, create a new project or they might want to assign themselves to a task or mark a task as complete, right? And so we want to make sure that people can actually accomplish those workflows to do the things that they're trying to do with the tool. Um, 
in the end, uh, the approach that we took was, was to focus on pages, uh, each of which contains several workflows within the page. Uh, the reason for that, which we'll get into in just a little bit, um, is we wanted to, to take a, a data-driven approach to deciding which uh, pages to remediate first. Um, within the Workfront app, there are about, about 100 pages that the app consists of. Um, not all pages are equally important. You know, something like the login page is extremely important since everyone will use it to log in. Um, something that might be a more, a more uh, specialized setup page that only a few admins use um, is, is not as highly visited. Um, and so we used data. We used um, just our, our website uh, analytics to see, you know, these are our 100 pages and these are our top 10 pages of, um, you know, the pages that people actually use the most and that use daily. Um, and so that was, that was in the end, our approach that we took was to focus on the top 10 most highly used pages that people would visit and then fixing all of the workflows within those pages to make sure that people could actually use them. Um, so with that, we had, a, we had a goal in mind, right? We had the buy-in from, from upper management. We had our own personal vision. Uh, we decided we were going to remediate those top 10 pages because that represented um, about two thirds of, of all of our user traffic. Um, so now came the kind of the hard part is, okay, who's gonna actually do the work? You know, it's, it's nice to talk about uh, that we're going to be uh, making our app accessible, but, but who, who actually has time um, to work on this? And so we, we had two options. Um, we could one, have the teams who owned those parts of the app, uh, or two, we could have a separate accessibility team um, work on it. And in the end, what we ended up doing was creating a separate accessibility team. And so we had um, myself as well as six other engineers um, and accessibility subject matter expert uh, form this new accessibility team that was gonna focus on, on remediating the app. Uh, and, and one of the main reasons that we did that um, was we actually got a lot of pushback within the engineering organization when we tried to ask other teams to, uh, to work on remediating parts of their content. Uh, we got a lot of pushback saying, you know, we already have quarterly commitments and we have features to ship and we can't focus on this right now, um, which is fair, right? If, if they've got quarterly commitments, um, we need to stick to those. Um, but it was honestly a little disappointing to hear because that's part of the reason that we got ourselves into this mess in the first place, right? Was was focusing on on shipping code and not necessarily taking the time to uh, to address these issues. And so it's it's kind of a hard problem to solve. You'll run into run into this with really any sort of technical debt at all, right? You can't just stop production and and eliminate all of your technical debt. Uh, but you do need to be wise about it, right? And in trying to slot in. Uh, improvements while also still shipping new features and, and keeping your customers happy. Um, and so looking at just the pros and cons of, of having a separate accessibility team, um, a couple pros. So our team could focus solely on accessibility without distractions. Uh, that was honestly pretty nice to, you know, personally not to have to have competing, um, competing priorities or the things I needed to be working on. It was nice just to focus on accessibility. Um, and then same for the other teams too, the, the teams who owned those parts of the application, they could focus on their feature work, their quarterly commitments. So everyone had very clear priorities. Um, the cons though, uh, our, our separate accessibility team, I think we were lacking some domain knowledge. You know, the teams who actually own those parts of the app, they had a lot more domain knowledge. They had um, the history of, of building it and working on it and supporting it. Um, and this was stuff that we needed to, um, get up to speed with as we were trying to reach into parts of the app that we had probably never worked in before. Um, and then secondly, the, I think the teams who owned those parts of the application, they missed out on the valuable learning experiences of, of helping to make their app accessible. You know, we had our team of, of accessibility experts and advocates, um, but I think they missed out on, on the chance to, to develop and grow uh, different uh, accessibility skill sets within their team to help develop and grow even more accessibility experts and advocates. Um, and so in the end, I, I still kind of have mixed feelings about our, our approach that we took um, over the last years. You know, it, it's a tough call and, and maybe we could have embedded more with uh, the different engineering teams to help them grow as well. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a tough call to make. Um, so let's keep going. So 
what, one of the reasons I think that having a single accessibility team, um, another downside for it is, is just that a small team moves too slowly, um, especially as, as new features are being built while old content is remediated. You know, so it's, it's not enough just to have a team of, of seven engineers working on the app when there are, you know, 300 other engineers building new content, right? You're kind of fighting a losing battle if you're trying to remediate old content while new content is being developed, if there's not a focus on accessibility and that new content. Um, and so when, when you're doing this, really everyone in the engineering organization needs to be involved. Uh, and so that's really where that second part of, of focusing on accessibility comes into play, uh, which is not just remediating the old content, but making sure that all new content that's being developed um, is built with accessibility in mind. Um, and so if we think about, you know, just think about the software development life cycle, uh, this is a simplified model, but generally UX and design will create a set of mockups, right, for some new feature that you're working on. Um, they'll present that to the engineering team. They'll have a, a technical breakdown meeting where they'll go over the mockups and um, try to poke holes in the design, right, and ask questions about it, get clarity. Um, the engineers will then go actually build that part of the that part of the product. Um, QA will QA it, test it, make sure it actually looks good, works well, uh, and then product or product management. Uh, will sign off on it and give their okay that this is uh, ready to ship and it will be released into production. Um, so that's a very basic software development life cycle. Um, obviously, it's more iterative if you're doing sort of an agile like life cycle. It's you know just one step through the whole thing. If it's both more a more waterfall approach, um, but regardless of of your iterations, that's more or less the the software development life cycle. And so when thinking about accessibility through all of that. Um, you know, how can we how can we bake accessibility into the software development life cycle? So first, I mean, we need UX and design to be on board. So they should create mockups that consider accessibility um, as the engineering teams then review them in a tech breakdown. Uh, they should consider, you know, possible accessibility issues um, as they review the mocks. Um, for developers and, and engineers, we then need to actually build things accessib accessibly. So we need to understand uh, the, the web content accessibility guidelines. We need to know how to actually build this correctly. We need to know what to look out for during code reviews. Um, for QA then, we need to, you know, during the audit process, make sure that each feature is accessible. So learning how to use a screen reader, learning uh, what items to focus on again. Uh, and then products, uh, again, just being okay with delaying and release. Um, you know, don't cut corners. If you're tight on a deadline, be okay with delaying it for a little bit if that's what it takes to uh, finish up doing it right. And so the reason, you know, the reason why we need to have everyone involved every step of the way is that it's, it's very difficult to build an accessible product if you have people um, that aren't on board or, or that are even actively fighting against the process, right? If, if you have pressure to uh, deliver code quickly and, and, and someone says, no, you don't need to worry about that right now, just get the code out the door. That's that's not gonna work, right? We need everyone to, to be on board. Um, and so how do you actually achieve that? How do you get buy-in from the rest of the engineering organization? Um, first, you need to share the vision. So it kind of in the same way that you've explored your own personal why, thinking about those financial, legal, and moral reasons. Um, share the vision with the rest of the company, help them get on board. Um, I think a lot of developers and designers take pride in their work and they enjoy knowing that they've, they've done a good job and they've built quality, a quality product. Um, so share the vision, help them, help them see that. Um, train and educate everyone in the organization. This is another really big one. I, I often think um, the reason you know, people might not focus on accessibility isn't for um, a lack of desire, but maybe a lack of uh, training, maybe a lack of a skill set where they feel they're under pressure to to deliver some code and they'd like to focus on accessibility, but they don't know how. So we need to provide you know, that training and education. Um, and then finally provide ongoing support and tools. So it's, you know, this training and education is really not just a one-time thing. You can't train someone in a, in a one hour workshop and now they're an accessibility expert, right? We need, we need to uh, reinforce this over time, provide that ongoing support. Um, so some of the things that we did um, specifically, so we had high level accessibility trainings in engineering wide meetings. So this happened, um, the accessibility presentations were 
um, about every six months that we, we would talk about the why and our larger efforts and what we're doing. Um, we also did accessibility workshops with each engineering team. So just with each team of you know maybe six engineers each, we would go through and, and help build things together. We would look at uh, you know common accessibility pitfalls and issues and how to solve them. Um, so a lot more one-on-one -on -one time. Uh, we created an accessibility guild that meets monthly. And so with that, we go over um, different accessibility topics. We'll often do some live coding, practice building, uh, different component types, making sure they meet accessibility criteria. Uh, we've created a whole bunch of documentation, a whole bunch of uh, wiki articles in our accessibility one-stop shops that contains lots of good resources with uh, checklists for things to look out for, um, various articles, uh, information on how to use screen readers, um, and hopefully everything that uh, an engineer would be looking for. And then we also had an accessibility Slack channel um, that people are able to reach out to us when they have questions or want to discuss uh, different problems that they're facing. Um, and so finally, one of those last organizational questions that we were looking at is, you know, how do we make accessibility a sustainable practice? Because we don't just want to focus on remediation for, you know, a few months and, and get to what we think is a good place and then totally forget about it, right? You're, you're never really done with accessibility. Um, and so how do you make sure that this becomes a sustainable practice? And so a lot of that just comes down to putting the right processes in place, right? Um, so some of the things that we did, uh, we have accessibility skills listed in our job requirements now, um, which is great and, and provides at least a, uh, if, if anything, a, a kind of a, a token sign of, hey, this is something that we, we care about and think about. Um, for everyone that's that's applying for jobs here. Um, we've included accessibility training into our, our new hire onboarding training. Um, so now every new hire in the engineering organization uh, will, will go through a series of accessibility courses uh, to help get them up to speed. Um, we're making accessibility audits uh, into our software development lifecycle. So again, what we talked about is um, you know during tech breakdowns, it's very important to go through the mock-ups and consider accessibility concerns. And then also before features are shipped, um, making sure that they go through accessibility audits before they're released to production. Um, and then the last one, which is uh, to be honest, still a still a work in progress, but uh, issue treatment. You know, sometimes uh, it, it's it can be tempting to um, try to distinguish between like a bug bug of something broken the app versus an accessibility issue. It can be easy to to say, okay, well that's an accessibility issue is not really a bug. That's that's an improvement, right? But it's it's important to treat those like bugs, that these are real issues of things that are broken, uh, maybe for a keyboard only user or a screen reader user. Um, and so to make sure that they're that they're treated as such. Um, so just wrapping up here. So if you want to look at, you know, how are we doing? Uh, again, I, I joined the company about two years ago. We began these accessibility, um, accessibility remediation focus in earnest about probably about a year to a year and a half ago. Um, so how are we doing? What progress have we made? Uh, so if you remember the then, so back in July, 2020, we had the accessibility conformance report and we failed most of our success criteria. So we passed 23 out of 50. Um, in December of 2020, 2021, uh, we released a new accessibility conformance report. Uh, this one is actually publicly available online, which is amazing uh, to have anyone be able to access that. Uh, and you can see we now support 36 of those 50 criteria. Uh, so we jumped up in 13 categories, uh, which is honestly super exciting uh, to, to say that we've, we've gone up and all that. Um, obviously, there's still more. We still have 11 partially supports and three does not support. And so we're, we're still working on those things. Um, but we've made a lot of progress, which, which is exciting to see. Um, and so just as we've gone through that, you know, we finished remediating eight of those top 10 pages. Uh, we've made global improvements to uh, Workfront's design systems. So this is an internal design system called Phoenix, uh, not to be confused with uh, Adobe's open source design system spectrum. Um, and then we've also made global improvements in our primary and secondary navigation bars. So this, those repeated elements that are found on just about every page in the app. Um, and so again, it's, it's been about a year, a year and a half, uh, but we still have more left to do, right? We've got to finish the last of those top 10 pages, uh, which as we talked about, um, represented about two thirds, about 66% of, of user traffic. Um, and so after that, we can keep moving on. We can go to our top 20 pages, which is 85% of all traffic, top 25 pages, which is 90%. Uh, 
um, and then just continue training, um, continue training our engineering organization, um, continue with uh, good onboarding practices, continue providing support. Um, because again, accessibility is, is never really something that you're going to finish. Uh, just like you wouldn't finish security and declare your app secure, you can never really declare your app accessible. There's always more to do. Um, so just in, in closing, we can look at nine lessons learned. Um, if there's ever a time to take a screenshot of some slides, at the end of this slide is probably the time. Uh, but nine lessons learned. Um, so the first, uh, you need buy-in from upper management to succeed. Uh, it's, it's nice if, if your accessibility concerns are, are a grassroots effort, uh, but eventually you're going to need buy-in uh, from the company to actually put time and resources into this. Uh, second, a single team is too small to tackle this on their own. You're going to need to get everyone on board uh, in order to be able to um, tackle what is a large app and make sure that things are, are built accessibly moving forward. Um, building off of that, everyone needs to be involved every step of the way. Uh, you're going to need everyone, not just engineers, but uh, designers, QA, product people, um, everyone. Uh, number four, engineers want to do the right thing, but you need to show them how. Um, again, it's, it's often not for a lack of desire. It's usually a lack of training, a lack of skills that prevents people. Uh, number five, you need processes in place so you don't dig yourself back into a hole again. It's not enough just to remediate your app if you're going to find yourself back in the same spot, you know, six months or, or a year later. Uh, number six, progress will be slow, so don't get discouraged. Um, this, this is a hard, a hard pill to swallow, um, but it, it takes a long time. It takes a long time to remediate a large app. It takes a long time to, to get new processes implemented in, in a large company. Um, so keep at it. Don't get discouraged. Uh, number seven, you'll never really finish your accessibility work. Uh, this is a uh, a years long and, and probably an infinite effort. Um, you will never really declare yourself done. Uh, number eight, focus on the highest leverage areas to maximize the benefits of your work. Um, again, use data, find those high usage pages, those high usage workflows, um, find the things that bring the, the largest return on investment. It's nice to see, uh, you know, wins that you can celebrate and build upon. And then finally, nine, uh, accessibility is more of an organizational challenge than it is a technical one. That's it. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, thank you for, for caring about accessibility, for being an accessibility advocate. Um, again, my name is Tyler Hawkins. Uh, if you want to reach out to me, I'd love to chat with you. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter. You can follow my work on Medium. Um, I think we've got a Q&A session uh, coming up next. Yep, that's correct. So yeah, we're going to uh, Q and A right now. And um, yeah, thank you so much, Tyler. I think it's really helpful too. You know that you're speaking from an insider's view. Right? This is like your experience um, working at a company and working on accessibility. So um, thanks so much for sharing with your experience. Uh, some of you have already put the questions in the Q and A, um, but yeah, you can continue to put them in, and we'll, we'll try to get to it. All right, so let's uh, start from the top on the Q&A box. I think it's blue, this is Jessica. Okay, any recommendations for classes to take on writing user stories to include accessibility acceptance criteria? Yeah, um, there are a lot of good resources. Um, I guess it would really depend on, on your learning style or your platform of choice, um, but I've watched quite a few good Pluralsight videos. If you're a Pluralsight user, there are a lot of good LinkedIn learning courses um, or even just reviewing like the, the WCAG docs themselves. The, the WCAG docs are, are pretty, they're pretty dry reading and they're pretty long, so they're hard to get through, but they do have specific stuff like um, they have like a quick reference guide that includes like very specific how to actually meet the success criteria or what it looks like. Um, so the quick reference guide would actually be a great place for, um, especially when it comes to like user stories and acceptance criteria, that'd be a good place to start. Thank you. Uh, next one, Sarah um, says, uh, thank you for your insights and experiences. I hope my question makes sense. I'm also very new to, to IT, but when it comes to remediating content, what are some of the challenges that you might encounter when it comes to making the product accessible yet secure? Yeah, accessible yet secure. Um, I'm honestly not sure if I understand the question. The accessibility and security are, they're not like at odds with each other, right? Um, and so you can make your product accessible and make it secure, right? So these are 
sort of two different fields. Um, sorry, maybe if you if you want to throw it in the QA again or the chat or something, if you can clarify it at all. Um, but if it helps at all, like yes, you can make it accessible and secure. Um, there's there's not really a, a conflict between the two. Thank you. Uh, next one is Dave. Thanks for the information sharing. What would we recommend for a new grad of, or a fresher prepared interested in accessibility engineer related positions within Adobe? Uh, come apply. Come apply and come work with us. Um, if you're interested in a new position, like, uh, yeah, check out the career, the job boards. Um, that's really the first step. You know, even if you don't feel like you meet all of the criteria, um, go ahead and apply anyway. I think it's pretty rare that we have a candidate that, that meets all of the criteria on the job listings. Um, and yeah, if, if that helps for, <laughs> for advice, um, as far as like actually, you know, preparing yourself technically for that kind of stuff, um, I would just focus a lot on, um, honestly, a lot of the basics of front-end development. Um, what, what's kind of interesting to me is that you get a lot of accessibility built in out of the box if you just use like the correct semantic HTML elements, right? If you um, use button elements for buttons rather than trying to create like a div element with a click handler on it, right? Like you lose a lot when you don't use the correct elements. So a lot of accessibility just comes down to doing UI development correctly, um, which is which is a little, maybe a little harsh to say that if, if it's not accessible, you, you you're doing it incorrectly, um, but I think I think it's true that if you can just get a good foundation for for UI development in general, just be, become familiar with HTML and CSS and JavaScript, um, you'll have a, a pretty good start for making things accessible. Cool. All right. Thank you. Uh, next question, Animish asks that: Do you follow the standard software development lifecycle model? If yes, how do you ensure the process development to newbies? Yeah. Um, okay. Do you follow the standard software development life cycle? Um, so what we've, what I outlined in my talk, um, yes, is what we follow. So we have, um, you know, we follow the agile methodology. We do scrum, we have two week sprints. Um, and so we're releasing code, uh, very frequent, frequently, right? So we have, um, patch releases that are going out. Uh, every week, as long as well as you know, major releases that are happening each quarter. Um, but so yes, if you want to call that the standard software development lifecycle, um, which I think it is, right? Have design, engineering, QA, release. Um, yes, we follow that in an iterative man manner. Um, if yes, how do you ensure the process development to newbies? Um, Trying to, trying to understand what you mean by that question. So, I mean, new engineers, right, will we'll be trained on how we do things here, right? Like how we, how we release code, how we develop code. Um, and so I guess if you wanna talk about how you ensure that, um, it's probably mentoring through your teammates and through senior engineers, right? So they'll, they'll teach you through code reviews of, hey, these are the things you wanna be looking out for. Um, hopefully you have other teammates as well that can give you pointers. Um, anyway, I, I hope that helps answer the question. Um, thank you. All right, the next one is uh, Anders. Uh, what is the best advice you can give to a future junior developer who wants to focus on AI? I'm studying by my own. Uh, AI as in artificial intelligence? I wouldn't know, uh, yeah. so it's not my field. Yeah. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Uh, okay, uh, Silvio asked, um, what was the biggest accessibility challenge for you at Adobe? For example, a specific tool was difficult to make accessible or perhaps challenge with communicating to other teams. Yeah, yeah, that's a great one. Um, so I guess with, without, without reiterating over the talk, like a lot, a lot of the challenges were organizational. So not so much of a, a technical nature um, but yeah, the, the organizational challenges that we went through, um, maybe one that we didn't talk about so much is that when it comes to remediating content, you often have to make some compromises between what's already been developed and what ideally would have been developed, uh, to begin with. 
And, and so what I mean by that is, um, you know, sometimes assuming the content was built um, in kind of an inaccessible way, there might be things that customers are used to and they're used to it behaving a certain way. And so then to then take away that behavior to then implement what should be like the quote unquote correct behavior um, can sometimes cause some, some frustration. Um, so for example, like if you want a concrete example, uh, one thing that we had was uh, there was like this, this little text input on, on a, a form field. And what would happen is it just had an autofocus attribute on it. And so it would steal away uh, the focus to go directly to it, right? So the focus is now in the middle of the page as opposed to at the top. And from an accessibility standpoint, like that's a, a pretty uh, heavily frowned upon thing is that you shouldn't be moving the focus somewhere because people get disoriented, right? If you can imagine a blind user that's using a screen reader, you've just been dropped into the middle of the page and you don't necessarily know that there's stuff before it or, or why you got put there, right? Um, and so generally like autofocus is, is, is frowned upon. Um, and so in our accessibility efforts at one point for that specific part of the page, we had taken away the autofocus um, and we got complaints from customers saying, now I have to go click into that box. It was autofocusing for me, right? Um, because they were used to that behavior. Um, and so in the end, what we did is we, we put it back to keep the customers happy. So the autofocus was still there. Um, but we added some additional screen reader notes basically saying, hey, focus has been taken here um, to whatever, in, insert your, uh, your current value for whatever the purpose of the form was. Um, but there's more content still before, or this is the context of where you are, right? And so we had to make kind of a, what I would call not an ideal uh, compromise there um, to keep both existing users happy, um, as well as try to make this more accessible. All right. Thank you. Um, oh, you see a question to pop up in chat. Okay, because of time, we'll, this, we'll take this as, as the last one, um, but we'll, we'll talk about ways you can connect with Tyler afterwards. Um, all right, so in, in the chat, it says, I'm part of the uh, accessibility working group at my company. I'm currently auditing our mobile app for accessibility violations and improvements. Any useful resources for um, accessibility on mobile apps, uh, React Native? Additionally, are there any automated tools that can help prevent the introduction of future violations? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, so for mobile apps specifically, um, well, let me let me take a step back. Um, automated tools in general, yes, there are some good ones that you can use. Um, so you can generally find like a good linter for your actual writing your code. So um, most of the stuff I write is is in React, and so like a really good linter. There's one called ESLint plugin JSX Ally, so it's just an ESLint plugin, um, but that's a great linter. Um, some other good automated testing tools. Um, you know, you can use something like I guess this isn't automated, but you can use something like uh, the Axe Dev Tools Chrome extension. It's a little browser extension. Um, that you can install and then just open it up and then click on your web page or click basically run it when viewing a web page and it will report back a list of accessibility violations on that page um, and there, there are a lot of tools like that um, a lot of them are built on this set of accessibility rules called axe core um, which basically just look at the web content accessibility guidelines the success criteria and try to try to codify those rules um, the thing to remember with those is that static analysis checkers with those like those can really only catch like 10 to 30% of accessibility issues. Um, they're good at identifying, you know, like semantic, basically where, where, you've, where you've used HTML incorrectly or you attached maybe a click handle where you shouldn't, or they could find like color contrast issues, but they're not very good at finding things that humans would identify like does the tab order make sense? Does the focus go where it should? Do, do things read properly? Um, and so as discouraging as it might sound, you know, the, the real key is not looking at automated tools, but through good use of manual testing with just a mouse, a keyboard, and a screen reader. Um, and then sorry, that was kind of a long-winded answer. But then specifically for <laughs> specifically for mobile apps, um, mobile apps are not my area of expertise. Um, since it is React Native, I would assume. You could also use ESLint with that since it's React Native. Um, and then you could also use your manual testing with your screen reader on your mobile app. Um, so that would be a great place to start, I think. 
Right. So um, because of time, uh, let's uh, sort of wrap up here. Thank you all for your questions. And thank you, Tyler, for um, answering them. Yeah, so we didn't get to your questions. You can connect with Tyler after this. Um, yeah, Tyler, what is the best way for the audience to, to connect with you? Yeah. Um, sorry, I saw Christine put that into the chat. Yeah, yeah um, there's some, some links, but yeah. you have to pick one. <laughs> yeah, go, go ahead and connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on Twitter as well. Not, not super active there, but LinkedIn is probably better. Um, and then, yeah, if you want to, I like to write a lot. Um, I've written mm -hmm. several things on accessibility. So if you want to read more about that, a uh, place like Medium is, is a great place to find me. Awesome. And um, yeah, do you have any final thoughts and encouragement that you'd like to give everyone before we officially end? Yeah, um, I guess just thank you for, for considering accessibility. Thanks for being accessibility advocate. Um, our numbers are few. And so I, I appreciate everyone who, who cares about this. Um, and, and secondly, if you know if if you have a desire to be more involved in accessibility, but don't feel like you have the skill set, um, I just encourage you to uh, to keep learning. It's it's not as hard as you may think. Um, again, just a good foundation of, of front end development skills um, will give you a big head start just in learning that. Um, so yeah, keep keep keeping at it, and thank you for for being an accessibility advocate. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Tyler, for taking the time to share with us. Um, so this is the official end of the session. So thank you all for joining. I um, want to give some reminders that we're going to have a Swag giveaway going. So we'd love for you to share any learnings or questions that you have from the session uh, on your socials. And don't forget to use the hashtag DJS2022 in your social post to increase your chance to win that swag. Um, if you want to be a speaker of an event in the future or share experience with fellow developers, um, you can also check out the uh, commenter events homepage. So all the links are in the chat um, as, um, as my, my colleague has posted. So the next event, as you can see up here, is Component Testing with Meet, View, and Cypress by Jessica Sachs. And it will happen at, it's going to be 11.15 Pacific time, which is about, I think, about half an hour, 25 minutes away from now. It's quite soon. So yeah, hope to see you there. Uh, we'll open the, we'll keep this webinar open for another five minutes or so. Uh, the information will be up here. Um, feel free to chat with everyone else. Um, share your Twitter and LinkedIn with each other if you want to connect. Um, and yeah, after that, we'll close the webinar for setup for the next event. So yeah, the link stays the same. And so please use it to join future sessions. Thank you all and enjoy.